Welcome to our show. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley with my co-host and daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we've got an amazing show today and some great guests, and it's such an mm -hmm. important topic because we're going to be talking about men and grief. And you know, um, men, you know, sometimes we don't know exactly how they're grieving because they tend to be a little solitary and a little more quiet, it seems, at times. Is it? I agree with you, way? Mom. I agree with you. You know, women tend to, we tend to look at each other, we tend to go, uh huh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, and do a lot of that kind of that stuff. And sometimes, like you said, men, might not show us how they're feeling, and maybe they even want to be strong for us. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and one of the things we've always said before is that uh, women tend to grieve face to face, and men more shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. And I think you found out a lot when you worked with the 9-11 families that the guys wanted to go out and play some ball or something. Absolutely, and we're gonna show a rolling later about that, but yes, I did. Yeah. And sometimes the best conversations, as you know, happen when we're doing things with men. Right. Or when we're in the car with guys, mm -hmm. and they're not staring at us trying to figure out what our response is to what they're saying. Right, and people are gonna see some of that on the Men in Grief video, mm -hmm. but talk a little bit about our panel, introduce them, because okay. we're excited. Yes, three great guys that I know well, and I'm really excited to have them here tonight talking about a subject that is needed out there and that people need to hear about, and it is Men in Grief, like you said, Mom. And the first person I wanna introduce is Glenn Lord. Glenn is right here, and he's, okay. he is the father of Noah. He is the president of the Board of Directors for the Compassionate Friends and he is the founder of the Grief Toolbox and a good friend of mine. So welcome to the show, Glenn. Thanks yeah. for Welcome, me. Glenn. And next to him is Vince Gelati. He is Hi. Adam's stepfather, and I appreciate him being here because we do not hear enough about stepdads and their role, and it is an important role, and you know, in I, this. I think they get discounted a lot, I, so uh, it's really important. Yes, I agree with you. Thank, and thank you for having me here. Welcome, welcome Vince. To have you on. And next to him is another stepdad, and it's Jeff Castaldo, and he is the stepdad of Tony Brown, right. and he is also the co-founder of the Tony Brown Foundation. So we are excited to Thank have you. you guys here today talking about this topic. It's a pleasure. We want, we want to get a little background before we show the role in in Men and Grief and talk a little bit about Men and Grief. Can you give us a little background on your child and how they died and, and how long it's been? Absolutely. Um, my son Noah was four and a half years old when he died of uh, complications of a tonsillectomy in uh, June of 1999. So mm -hmm. it's been um, been about 16 years, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been a long journey. Right. Yeah. Vince, how about you? And Adam uh, passed away in 2008 uh, of a drug overdose, and uh, his mother, my wife Christine, and I were only married in 2008. So I was just getting to know Adam, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it was an ongoing uh, thing. I, I and um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was, our relationship was cut so short mm -hmm. because we'd only been married a few uh, months. And, and how old was Adam when he died? Twenty-two. Okay. Wow. I'm, I'm just thinking, but you and Chris just get married, and then something like this happens. That's a yes. lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how about Jeff? Um, my son Tony uh, died in 2009. From a uh, medical mistake, and uh, he was—he uh, was six years old when I met him. Mm -hmm. He was 24 when he passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of in contrast to to uh, Vince, I kn knew Tony from when he was so young. Mm -hmm. I think I had an advantage, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a wonderful advantage of, of knowing him mm -hmm. for so long. He was a great guy. Great and man. you raised him, and you adopted him. Yes, I did. So you were a father to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Well, let's talk a little bit. Maybe why don't we see the roll-in right now, and they can get it ready, and then let's talk about your take on what you think about men and grief and, and how they respond. I work with boys a lot, and I work with men, and sometimes the best conversations happen when we're playing basketball together, when we're riding in the car together. I worked with the FDNY Fire Department in, of New York, for 10 years. Often the firefighters open up more if I'm not directly looking at them, if I'm maybe doing something with them or they're being active. So I think those are some of the best conversations. We um, are much more comfortable when we have a secondary focus that we're focusing on in terms of where we're going with that. And I think sometimes that confuses um, those people in our lives because sometimes the way men grieve is not traditional in terms of, we, as you pointed out earlier, we don't necessarily uh, have as much sitting around and talking about it. It may or may not be different for different men, 
But it, it may not be the, the way to which men find that to hope. But I do think there's oftentimes through those activities, and if you can share that uh, in that activity, and I think that men doing things together mm -hmm. is the way that we can relate to one another, especially um, if we're doing things around uh, you know, working. You know, I find working on others with their foundations or with their things they're doing, and you kind of have that general topic, you can open that up and really, for me, is a place I found I'm able to much more easily share and, mm -hmm. and feel and can really grow in my mm -hmm. grief. Now, Vince, you you really came in to support your wife a lot, and and not knowing that. What's your thought about that support and men in grief, and and what what did you find? Well, in, in my case, I'm an introvert, so I hold everything in. But she needed me, so I had to be there, and I couldn't be thinking about myself. I had to be thinking about her. I I have some of the guys tell me when they um, when it it is you know they didn't know the child that well and they're early on in the relationship that it's really intense because the uh, spouse be it male or female uh, really they're kind of surprised how strong the grief is. Well, um, f for me, like you were saying, I I was just getting to know Adam and. Um, the last week of his life, we had our best relationship then, wow. and it was—I could see it growing. I mean, mm -hmm. the very last time I saw him was one of the best times I was ever with him. Mm -hmm. And um, if we only could have had more time, right. you know, we could have. Right. We had a lot of the same interests, and we could have developed a, a stronger bond. Yeah. And Jeff, how about you? What was your experience with? What's your thought on men? It was, uh, you know, the grief, Anne's grief, my wife's grief was so intense, uh, and, and ours were different, and I had a lot of trouble reading it at first, mm. and her uh, reading mine, I'm sure, and I was more, much more quiet, and uh, I had the pleasure of knowing Tony so many years that um, it was uh, a little more intense for me, maybe, in different ways than, than uh, Anne might have thought. You know, she, the mother, you know, someone's mother who, who gave birth to this child. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine the, the intenseness and the, and the, the hurt um, for that, you know, even though mine was great. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm also thinking with guys I've noticed a lot, you guys are, you guys are fixers. You like to fix things. Mm -hmm. And I think it must be really hard when you see, you know, you're in pain and your wife is in pain and your family's in pain and you, you can't fix it at the end of the day. Yeah, you're not sure what what to say mm -hmm. and, and there's so many different things that come up um, you want to make her feel better you, you know you can't fix it mm -hmm. um, but sometimes you or myself uh, would withdraw mm -hmm. and not comment on a particular subject mm -hmm. at all because I had no idea what to say right. I um, I didn't want to aggravate the situation mm -hmm. and uh, and she in turn didn't uh, understand my grief and she was, I mean, she was busy with the terrible loss. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I tried not to take, it's, it's hard to not take a little offense to that when it's happening, mm -hmm. but I tried very hard not to because, um, you know, that, I just couldn't well, do that. Well, it's kind of like you're damned if you do, you do if, and you're damned if you don't. Y yes. Because you don't want to aggravate the situation. So sometimes you don't say anything, but then I hear women getting angry because mm -hmm. it's like, why aren't they responding or why aren't they grieving like me or, or why, why aren't, aren't they, they crying? crying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I, think, I think it was interesting to me, one of the things that I, I heard in all of, in all yeah. of is this talking about, even, even today, we're here supposed to be talking about men and grief. That's supposed mm -hmm. to be our focus. And yet, where's the focus coming? What are yeah. we talking about? We're talking about how our wives are there, what the, mm -hmm. the relationship of that. And I think that's kind of interesting because I do think mm -hmm. oftentimes men do subjugate their own grief for those around us because we are supposed to fix that and that can complicate our grief journey because we in, until we have a chance to recognize that we can't solve that that can really add to it a lot I think it was interesting that the answers you know are still coming out that way yeah and Vince you were saying that you're an introvert and I think that's really interesting I appreciate you being here today because I think there are a lot of men that are going to identify with this because what happens I would think is that you have to come out and be more extroverted than you would naturally want to be. You know, with funeral events, uh, family coming in, it, it's got to be a huge thing. Yes, and, and one of the things that has really helped me and my wife is getting to know uh, people through compassionate friends mm. and the meetings and workshops and, and conferences we've gone to. Uh, 
it's just been so helpful. So being around other men too, I bet. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think Glenn's bringing up a really good point. I mean, the focus at the beginning of this conversation was about their wives, and we were initiating that. We're women. Right. How we're going to help the women, and how we're going to help our wives. And it's like, I would think, like you said, sometimes men's grief is put is shelved, is put on a shelf because people are saying, "How is your wife?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's oftentimes it is. It is society does that. I mean, how many times? Did people come up to you in public and ask, you know, how's Ann doing? How's Chris doing? Exactly. And, and it's much rarer that someone asks you how you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the beauties, like you say, of the Compassionate Friends, is it's a place where people can ask you how mm -hmm. you're doing. And mm -hmm. you can have that safety to be able to, to share how you're feeling, which is ultimately, you know, important. Yeah, and getting that input from other people, like people from the Compassionate Friends and other men. Um, what kinds of things have men said? that have come up for you guys? Just any quote or any comment or has, has anything really struck you and helped you? I, I guess and this goes, kind of goes back to the male-female thing mm -hmm. and I, one of the things that really helped me was uh, when my son died um, and he my, died of a tonsillectomy? He died of a ton 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 of a tonsillectomy, yeah. yes. And, uh, at four? At four and a half, yeah. Four and a half, four and okay. half. That half's very important. He was yeah. very big on that. Yeah, that was That's four and a half very time. good point to say. He, he, was, he was very big. He was big very on big on that. He was. He would. He would be offended if you told him he was four. <laughs> he was four and a half. Um, but um, yeah, my wife's cousin had had a child die about three years earlier, and so I ran over to the, the gentleman and I said to him, and I cornered him, and I told him, How, "What am I going to do? How am I going to solve this?" I because that was the answer I wanted to do, and he uh, said to me, he "said There's there's not an answer here. I can't tell you the solution, but what I can tell you is." You need to honor yourself at the same time you're honoring your wife and give yourself time to feel what you're going to feel while you're feeling um, what you're feeling and recognize that you're both going to be in different places. You're rarely going to be at the same mm -hmm. place at the same time. And I think that was, for me, very, very helpful because it's uh, almost never that were Tanya and I in the same place. You know, In that waves of grief, I was up, she was down, I needed this, she needed that. And uh, to give that respect for each other, I think, was good mm -hmm. for me to know that I wasn't mm -hmm abandoning her by respecting myself at the same oh, time. Oh, I love that word, mm. that you weren't abandoning her. Mm -hmm. That that really comes over, for, that really strikes me, because, uh, I yeah, abandoning, D does that strike you? Yes, it, that I can I can understand that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and getting to know the other, other gentlemen, like these two great guys and many other people, hearing other men talk about uh, not being able to help their wives, or mm -hmm. why don't, um, they didn't really ask questions as why don't I cry, but the problem is people see me and my wife doesn't see me cry. Mm -hmm. I may not cry in her presence, I may not cry at all for a while, mm -hmm. um, but she, I think she feels funny that I don't, and I don't mm -hmm. know how to address that. And, I love uh, that, because I hear that so much, Jeff, from women. I, my husband's not crying, and it's bothering me, and I don't know what's going on with him. They're experiencing such intense pain, mm -hmm. and I think they they look at you and say, "He looks too all right, right. right. for this situation." Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we actually hold back on our on our showing that oh, yeah. emotion in front of them. But if you could see us in the shower and you could mm -hmm. see us uh, at moments where we're by ourselves, that's not the true reality. And the the pain is there, and it comes out at different times. But sometimes I think we do even more so have a societal pressure to put on that facade, to, mm -hmm. to put on the mask that we wear through the, you know, I, men and women both wear it. And, uh, but I do think that's a strong reality. Of yeah. mm -hmm. well, well, you know, my, my mom and I wrote a book called Real Men Do Cry with an, a former NFL quarterback, Eric Kipple. And when we interviewed him and talked to him about this, he said, you know, you've got to realize how we're socialized as guys. It's like walk it off, suck it up, big boys don't cry. You know, we're giving all these messages. So that's kind of the way we've been socialized. And then I would imagine having something this horrific, you are mm -hmm. still got those messages to a certain extent. Yeah. Be strong for your other people. And like you said, Glenn, we don't, we don't know what's going on with you guys when we can't see you. Just because men look like they're not grieving doesn't mean they're not grieving. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, wanted to uh, ask Vince, um, you only knew, uh, and, uh, Adam. Adam, how long? I. I Maybe three years, something yeah. like that. But I mean, but you were closer. You had just gotten married, at, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I yeah. was much closer to him at the yeah. end rather than. Now, what I wanted to ask you is, did do you feel any disenfranchisement as far as um, 
do I have the right to grieve as much as these two guys? No, no. Good. That's good. No, absolutely not. Good. That's awesome. Because uh, I have a feeling there are some people that don't. And, I, and I'm kind of wondering if maybe compassionate friends and being able to be around these guys and they understand that, uh, that about, but I wonder if the rest of the world would, you know, give you the kind of support you need to. Um, I, I think they do. Uh, my grief is very personal, mm -hmm. and I mean that, that's my personality. And and um, the the friends I've made through compassionate friends, the people I've met there, I mean they've all been supportive. And uh, we ha we do have uh, meetings and workshops for step parents, mm -hmm. which oh, fabulous, is a, which is a big help. And where's your chapter located? And, and well, I actually don't belong to a chapter. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't have one where we live, but but we attend all the, uh, the regionals national and the regionals. Nationals, yeah. Great, and, it, and people can go to compassionateprince.org uh, yes. and find out where those all are. Now, Heidi was mentioning Eric Hipple, the quarterback for the Detroit Lions, and Big Eric was telling us when I get home from workout or tryout or whatever, I go down in the basement and I light a candle, and that's my time, and I go down there and listen to music and think, and, and that was, uh, his son shot himself, um, uh, died by suicide, yeah. and, and uh, you know, this big guy just goes down and does that thing. Do you guys have any, any stuff that you do, or any things that you do that might help people that you find particularly comforting? Well, for me, water was always connected with my son. One mm -hmm. of the, some of our best memories was uh, swimming together and being in the water, and, um, Again, I find that they, that being in the the bathroom, it's kind of a quiet, enclosed space, mm -hmm. and so I would say just you know sitting in the tub and just kind of having that private time when mm -hmm. I, I know I'm kind of in that safe environment and no one's there, and uh, it it feels I don't know maybe that's just the water all mm -hmm. around me, but I kind of feel like uh, I can share some moments in time. But then there's times when I want to just go. Uh, Go sit in the tub and be with him in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And brings back all the memories of him and you in the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it brings that. It's yeah. just a, there's that strong connection. I mean, there's that, that, that emotional mm -hmm. kind of tie and connection that I think ties back into him in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, the most emotional time comes in the the candle lighting ceremonies mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. attend. I mean, if before I went to one, I didn't think it was going to be much, but when you experience three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred people in candle lighting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ceremony. It's very, very powerful. Yeah, they do them at the National Conference, which will be in Arizona, and uh, they have them there. But they also, if you want to go to a candle lighting, you can find uh, the second week in December, uh, you can go to the CompassionateFriends.org website, and you're going to find there's a candle lighting in your neighborhood or one that you can probably get to, yeah. and uh, that's uh, really comforting. It's a worldwide candle lighting. For those yeah. of you who don't know, it's all, it spans the entire globe. That, that light doesn't go out. It starts in one time zone, and for 7, 7 p.m. in every time zone, it goes all around the world. And, and like you say, it's just that thinking that we're not alone, that there's mm -hmm. just literally yeah. millions of people that are in celebrating. And you can also go on the computer and talk about your child on the website during that candle lighting. They have a whole yes. candle lighting blog for you, mm -hmm. and, and that's a wonderful thing to do. And Jeff, how about you? What? Um, I, I don't have a particular ritual or thing, but um, my my son loved extreme sports, mm -hmm. motorcycles, uh, wakeboarding, s skateboarding, and whenever I see those events on television, who I watch occasionally with my other sons, um, I just my mind replays all the wonderful times and instances Tony had with those. A lot of them are injuries that <laughs> were common in those sports mm -hmm. that he worked right through like a like Superman sometimes. Um, and, and the candle lighting, it, you know, I know the first time I went to a candle lighting, you, you sit there and you see these hundreds and hundreds of people. And, and it got me thinking, there's thousands, so many thousands more that aren't present here mm -hmm. that I can't see, that it really, uh, it helped me relate to Tony's loss. Mm -hmm. and, other, and as far as men, being able to, uh, being able to talk to guys like this mm -hmm. and uh, without any other influence really uh, made me let my emotions come to the surface much more than at first mm -hmm. when I didn't uh, interact yeah. with uh, other grieving men. Being with other grieving men, I'm wondering if there's other things that you guys, any advice you can give out there to people that want to help guys that are grieving mm -hmm. and don't know how, any kind of tips. And would you things? respond differently now than you would have? 
to guys as far as helping them? Well, I definitely am much more empathetic. I mean, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I think understanding what, what the grief is is mm -hmm. something that's changed, you know, very much for me. I, and I think also when you're, if you're helping a, a man in grief, I think one of the biggest things to recognize is don't judge how it is he's grieving. Mm -hmm. um, give him that freedom to, to be where he's at and what he's doing. Because I think oftentimes that additional pressure of other people in our lives feeling like we're not doing it right, um, you know, you don't feel like you're doing it right anyway. No matter what you do, mm -hmm. you're not, you don't feel like you're doing it right. Yeah. And to have especially those closest to you, you know, criticize you and feel that way can really add a lot to your complications of what am I supposed to do. So mm -hmm. just give them that space and love them mm -hmm. and know that you may not understand where they're at, but they also don't really understand where you're at either. Right. Vince, I know you've got to have a thought about this for guys because, you know, I, I think you're so important here because not everybody wants to be reached out to and, you know, and, and in certain ways they want to be able to be back a little bit. They don't want to be front and center. Well, before Adam's death, uh, the only death I experienced were older mm -hmm. people, older mm -hmm. relatives, and I didn't realize, you know, how hard it would be for, you know, a young person to pass away that you wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, now I understand a little bit better what, what parents go through, and um, it, it, I, I just didn't think it would be that, that hard. I mean, look, when a, an adult passes away, it's bad enough, but you figure they've lived most of their life anyway. Mm -hmm. and, but when a young person passes on, it, it's so hard. And mm -hmm. I, I think just being uh, close to people uh, you meet and listen to their story and exchange uh, stories, uh, that's the, a big su support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, as Vince said, I think the stories, when you talk to other men, uh, are very important and, and try to uh, ask them what their child's favorite toy was mm -hmm. or their food or like what that. was their best hobby mm -hmm. because everybody's, the death, the death story is so out there and mm -hmm. it's the one story that people uh, ask a lot and, and go to to tell and I think uh, I don't think enough men and women uh, Concentrate on the life stories. Yeah, there's so many wonderful little instances throughout their lives that brought joy mm -hmm. Were hysterical or mm -hmm. you know, whatever and uh, I think it's I think I found it a good way to to just uh, kind of buddy up to somebody and get a mm -hmm. little bit better feeling for them talking about something like uh, uh, a few years ago, I asked Glenn what Noah's favorite toy was, and I think it was a, it was a, a little kid's kitchen. Yeah, uh, oh, I love that, and I love that you remember. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's cool, you know. It, and we all get to know. We all feel we know these children. Right. We've, we've heard so much about them. We know their parents. Yeah. And uh, I, I love knowing that Noah was the uh, cookie man or the chef cook, cookie chef, man. Chef cookie man. <laughs> you know, and that's I just think that's cool. I, I think. Uh, I think that would be a good way for people to uh, to interact with other people and feel that. Uh, I love closer. the questions you asked too, the specific questions. What were their favorite hobbies and toys and food? Those mm -hmm. are great questions to ask anybody. Mm -hmm. Like you said, we do. We focus on the way they died. And the way they died, I mean, society does. And the way they died is a moment in time. It's the way that they lived that we want to talk about. Yeah, right. You know, I, I'm thinking it's interesting because all three of you have lost kids in different kinds of ways, you know, with a medical error, with a drug overdose, and, and with uh, another medical, I guess we would call it a medical error. But uh, what I've noticed at the Compassionate Friends meetings is early on people are so focused on how they died. The people that come, are very, we're very focused on how they died, particularly where uh, drug overdose is concerned. and. Um, Gosh, Vince, what's your thought on it? Because it really doesn't matter later on, does it? As people get no, to know each no. other. I mean, there's no judgment. We don't judge. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know what's what's happened. Um, yeah. Because there can be shame and guilt, and what about that? And what about anger? Guys like to, you know, mm. seem to be some anger. Well, you, you, you identify. Well, with that. you know, I'm the uh, I'm the physician in our case who made the mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, my anger, my anger has lessened over the years. Um, it's still there. Um, I know it's not, um, it's not that productive to have it, and it gets in the way of things, mm -hmm. but I can't shake it 100%. Uh, at first, it was extremely intense. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, my reactions would have been horrific mm -hmm. at, the, at the time it happened, mm -hmm. uh, if I could let my anger out. Mm -hmm. um, how do you do? How did you do it for, for um, people, men that are listening? Mm -hmm. Well, a in, lot in of the rain. medical mistake, in in our case, uh, researching the procedure that was done wrong, and uh, trying to maybe make a lawsuit, which we didn't uh, prevail at. Uh, just you know, the, the a lawsuit doesn't certainly bring the child back or, or anything. But maybe this physician doesn't need to be a physician. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. was a first year resident. Yeah overseen by a second year resident mm -hmm. and either maybe the hospital needs different rules yeah. or checks mm -hmm. or that person's not uh, maybe that person's heart isn't into it enough mm -hmm. to you know to make sure their 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 job is being done well mm -hmm. how long did it take you to realize that it, I heard that word you said you realized it was non-productive how long did it take you for people that are watching the show? I mean, you know, you just don't get rid of anger suddenly. Oh, no, no. It, it slowly faded away, and I have to give my wife a lot of credit in that because she pointed out to me how unproductive it was. Mm -hmm. And the more, uh, you know, the Tony Brown Foundation was founded and having support group and trying to help other people, um, that, that anger had no place there, really. You, mm -hmm. can't, you can't, I didn't think you could help other people by constantly going back to that angry spot. The story comes up and you right. feel it, but it doesn't, uh, we all have anger or Yeah, uh, well we whatever. could certainly go on with that, but it's yeah. time for us to close the show. And you, you three have been so awesome and thank you so much for being on the show. Thank and you I think there, I know there's so many men out there who are gonna appreciate this and, and identify with what you're saying. And we thanks, thank you so much for being on. Thanks you guys, and I agree with my mom. There's so many guys that are gonna be watching the show and there's so many women that are gonna be watching the show because they wanna know how to help their guys. And who better to give them that advice than three real men here. So I love it, thank you guys so uh, much. Thank and you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for watching this show today. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley with my co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. And we're in partnership with the Compassionate Friends and we would like you to know that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. <laughs>